Oh, hi, over here. You got me watching Deadly Class. You know, this was created by Rick Remender. You know what? Speaking of Rick Remender, let's talk about Uncanny X-Force. Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris, and I'm going to have a theme this month. Welcome to X Month. Every episode this month is going to have some sort of relation to X-Men. And to start it off, I wanted to talk about my personal favorite X-Men related run, which was Uncanny X-Force by writer Rick Remender and a variety of artists. I'm going to use this episode to talk about some of writer Rick Remender's personal tropes and techniques, and what it is that I like about his work. Uh, I'll go into some detail about the first third of the uh, Uncanny X-Force run, but I won't go into deep spoilers in case you haven't read it yet, because in case you haven't guessed yet, it's going to get a recommend from me. All right, let's dive in. Rick Remender broke into comics by self-publishing the humor book Captain Dingleberry in the late 90s while he was working in the animation industry. He worked on films including Iron Giant, Titan AE, and Anastasia, but his first love was apparently comics. After Captain Dingleberry was picked up by Slave Labor Graphics, he followed it up in 1999 with Blackheart Billy, a book about a skater punk along with his frequent collaborator Kieran Dwyer. Is Billy a cyborg by any chance? No, that's just how he looks. Will you get out of here, Infotron? Sorry, folks. Remender kept busy in the industry penciling on some books like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and inking The Avengers, and started to get notice in the early 2000s with his creator-owned books that he wrote, including Sea of Red, Strange Girl, and especially Fear Agent at Image. And there are several of his techniques or personal tropes on display in those early books that will continue on through his work in Uncanny X-Force. I'm talking about things like his use of humor, his amazing collaboration and his ability to be a talent scout finding new artists, uh, his ability to use deep themes throughout his work. His books are about something. And even when it comes to just simple action scenes, he's got outside-the-box thinking in terms of finding new ways to use superpowers. The first arc in Uncanny X-Force is called The Apocalypse Solution, with some gorgeous artwork by Jerome Opeña. Opeña is a Filipino artist who had done a small handful of issues in the early 2000s before meeting Remender and collaborating with him on issues of Strange Girl and Fear Agent before illustrating the first arc of Uncanny X-Force with another four a year later. Opeña's artwork is distinctive for its delicate line work and intricate details, as well as his use of dramatic camera angles in his compositions. The makeup of the team helps inform what the book itself will be about. Wolverine has assembled a team of X-Men to work off the books to proactively hunt down mutant threats, and their first target is Apocalypse, a powerful mutant they have intel that indicates he has been reborn. The rest of the team includes Deadpool and Phantom X, two people who were part of the Weapon Plus government program that gave Wolverine his adamantium skeleton and claws. Additionally, Psylocke and Archangel round out the team. Archangel's family wealth funds the team. One thing that isn't explicitly spelled out by the book is that all of these characters share something in common. They all have a past where they've been mind-controlled or brainwashed to be killers. And ostensibly, Wolverine is just gathering this team because they are all killers. They're willing to do what it takes to potentially find a permanent solution to enemies like Apocalypse but all of these characters are broken and are haunted by their past. That will come to inform a lot of the themes that this book encapsulates. This is really Wolverine's first time as the true leader of the team, without anyone above him giving direction. Deadpool is included as the comic relief for the team, and Remender's dialogue for him is fantastic. As expected, he's hilarious. Get him off! What, like give him a lap dance? Show him a dirty movie? Best friend style massage? Unexpectedly, Deadpool is also the heart of the team over the course of this run. The book begins with Psylocke and Archangel in a committed relationship, while Phantom X harbors a crush on Psylocke that she is aware of and not against, but is loyal to Archangel. 
Each of these characters' backstories will ultimately come into play over the run of the comic. That is not to say that you need to be a longtime X-Men reader to understand anything that's going on in this book. It's just to say that if you know more about these characters' backgrounds, it may give you a bigger emotional payoff. But one of the things I absolutely love about this run is that over its three years, it's not interrupted with any crossovers or guest stars from other books. It is self-contained. It definitely takes place within the Marvel Universe. There's, there's no doubt about that. But uh, it has a concrete beginning, middle, and a decisive end. Things change for the team by the end. It's, it's very unique in serialized superhero comics to get something like this. But I will say that the thing I love the most is that it's a complete story. In the first arc, the team infiltrates the cult of Akkad, who worship Apocalypse and are raising a reborn version of him, who is now a young boy. X-Force have to go through Apocalypse's final horsemen, inventive creations by Remender and Opeña. Along the way, Famine starves Archangel nearly to death, and Deadpool drags him to safety. We're later shown how Deadpool keeps him alive by feeding Archangel bits of himself. This is simultaneously a hilarious and gross example of how Rick Remender will think outside the box to come up with inventive ways to use character superpowers. In this particular instance, Archangel is starving to death, Deadpool doesn't have access to any resources, they're in a very remote area, and he is just cutting off strips of himself to keep Archangel alive because Deadpool has a healing factor, so he can, he can just do that and he'll stay alive. Uh, it's gross, it's kind of subversively funny, and that's just what I like about Rick Remender. A lot of his stuff is like that. The fact is, Deadpool is a hired killer, but he ends up being the most loyal, the most heroic in some instances. He's the moral compass for the team. A hired killer is. It's kind of subversive. Wolverine's team ultimately cuts through the cult and the horsemen and find their way to the young boy but the team has a change of heart when faced with the harsh reality of executing a defenseless child who has yet to commit any crime. Even Archangel, who was changed from Angel by Apocalypse and has more reason to hate him than anyone else, can't bring himself to kill the child. But Phantom X does. And at this point, everything else throughout the rest of the book flows out of the ramifications of this decision. Uh, a lot of the book will be spent with the team talking with each other about whether somebody can be redeemed. And uh, Phantom X was uh, then a relatively new character, not a ton of backstory to him, so he ends up being a mostly blank canvas that Remender can work with, and he ends up being sort of the, the center of that debate of whether somebody can be redeemed. One thing I like about this book is that by the end, there's a concrete resolution to Phantom X's character arc. The second arc features human cyborgs from a possible future coming back to kill X-Force because their decision leads to a future where mutants control the world with an iron fist. Think of it like a reverse version of the famous Days of Future Past storyline in X-Men. Issue 10 begins the most popular story arc called the Dark Angel Saga. With Apocalypse dead, his brainwashing from Archangel's past leads him to become the new Apocalypse. The team is forced to fight their friend, externalizing the fight the team has been having internally since Phantom X killed Apocalypse. The team takes desperate measures, heading to a parallel reality to find a life seed, an object created by celestial gods to cancel out Apocalypse, and which is the only thing that can kill Archangel now, but which is not available in X-Force's reality. The reality they visit is that of Age of Apocalypse, the popular crossover from the 90s, which featured a world where Professor X never lived long enough to form the X-Men, so Apocalypse conquered the planet. The X-Force team meets alternate versions of friends and lovers, including Nightcrawler and Jean Grey, who are both dead in the team's reality. They meet an evil version of Wolverine and a heroic version of his enemy Sabretooth. The story arc is full of action and adventure, but it explores the idea of how one's nature is not set in stone. It's their life experiences that determine who they are. 
the X-Force team also gets to witness exactly how bad the world could be if Archangel continues to exist as Apocalypse. The arc concludes with Psylocke having to make the decision to use the Life Seed against Archangel, who she loves and doesn't want to die. One thing I have to give Rick Remender credit for is he really doesn't kill off a character purely for shock value. He's only going to do it if it drives a story forward, and he's going to find a clever way to leave it open as an option for future writers to still work with. Um, examples include he wrote Punisher, where Punisher was killed and turned into a Frankenstein-esque monster, but he found an in-story reason to revert him to his status quo for the next creative team. Uh, in Uncanny Avengers, he finds a way to bring back dead characters like Banshee and Doc and Wolverine's son. In uh, his book, uh, in this book, Uncanny X-Force, he finds a way to bring back Omega Red as a trio of clones known as the Omega Clan. So he doesn't just kill off a character and, you know, wipe that out as a story option for future writers. He finds a way to give writers... Uh, new material to work with. He will only use death to change a character's circumstance because he does understand the tools you're working with when you're doing serialized superhero comics. In fact, both the Blob and Nightcrawler from the Age of Apocalypse dimension end up becoming characters throughout the rest of Uncanny X-Force. This Blob is a psychopath, and Nightcrawler joins X-Force to hunt him down and get revenge. It's bittersweet because he has a lot of the personality of Wolverine's late best friend, but he's also much crueler and is a killer. This book trades in on the history of each character, with Wolverine having to face down his demons in the form of his archenemy Sabretooth and misguided son Dokken. Psylocke faces an alternate version of herself when she was corrupted by the Hand to be an assassin. And Phantom X deeply regrets his decision to kill the child version of Apocalypse and creates a genetic clone in a pocket universe that he can enter called the world. Time can move artificially there, and he has the new child, named Evan, raised by a loving couple. He wants to prove that under the right circumstances, Evan can grow up to be a good person. He also wants to find out if he can be redeemed. Other storylines for the Uncanny X-Force book include Phantom X being put on trial for his actions by the Captain Britain Corps, and that puts his teammate Psylocke in direct conflict with her brother, who is the Captain Britain of her reality. Uh, there are also some really well-done pacing decisions, where after a big arc there will often be just an issue or two that are standalone to help set the characters up for whatever the next story is. And each arc can just sort of build and build, and then the payoff is that much more because Rick takes the time to make us care about the characters and set up their circumstances. Uh, by the very end, the final act involves a new version of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants that's comprised of people that all have incredibly personal vendettas against each team member in Uncanny X-Force. The one team member who ends up protecting Evan the most ends up being Deadpool. He becomes deeply invested in making sure Evan has a chance at growing up a normal life. There is a series coda where Evan tells Deadpool how much his faith meant to him and how Deadpool is his hero. I'm convinced that this character arc for Deadpool in Uncanny X-Force was the basis for the story arc in Deadpool 2, the movie. Uh, that didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it's a story of a guy, Deadpool, who is kind of self-centered, he can't take things seriously, and he finds a child who everybody thinks is going to grow up to be a threat, but he has faith that if this child is raised under the right circumstances, could be a good person. I think that Deadpool sees that as a path he could have gone down uh, in the right circumstances, and he wants to give this kid that opportunity. In this case, it's Evan, uh, also known as Genesis. Um, I like that. I like that a lot. I think that every character on this team goes through a character arc and is changed by the end of it. Uh, we've talked about what Deadpool's arc is, but everybody goes through a change either physically or emotionally. They all go through that, and they are all talking about the consequences of, you know, do the ends justify the means? As in, is killing an enemy 
a workable solution. Well, by the end of the storyline, I think there's a concrete resolution to that where characters have a consensus. If I have to give a knock against this run, it's that the artists change frequently. There's Jerome Pena, Isad Ribich, Billy Tan, Mark Brooks, Greg Ticini, Robbie Rodriguez, Phil Noto, and more. Most of those guys are fantastic, but it means that each arc can look a bit different than the one before it, and there are a couple issues where your taste may be such that you legit don't care for how an issue looks. That's the case for me, but the vast majority of the artists are actually incredible. Rick Remender's sense of humor and his personal background in the 80s uh, skater punk scene helps inform, in my opinion, his, his actual love and care for the underdog. And I think that this is a team of underdogs, and I think that he legit cares about all of them. And I think it, it informs the book, it makes us, the reader, care about the book. Uh, care about the team. I think that one of the things I love about it is that it is a complete story. You don't always get that in serialized superhero stories, but there's an inciting incident. The team deals with all sorts of consequences. There's a series of escalating uh, confrontations, and ultimately there's a concrete resolution to the storyline. Uh, I really like that. I appreciate that. It's a three-year run that you're going to get something really cool out of. Uh, it deals with deep themes, you know, nature versus nurture. Uh, do the ends justify the means? Well, a lot of Rick's books deal with themes like that. Um, I think that the book Low is a fantastic example. That deals with the idea of hope. Uh, can hope be a productive, amazing thing? Absolutely. Can it put you in danger? Well, that's another angle to look at. Uh, that's just one example. Obviously, I love Deadly Class by him. Uh, definitely recommend that one. Uh, Fear Agent is fantastic. But for some reason, Uncanny X-Force, it just works for me. Maybe it's because I already liked some of these characters. You know, I like Wolverine, and I really liked Rick Remender's take on it. In case it isn't clear, I give this book a strong recommendation. I believe it's now available as an omnibus, so you could read the whole thing all at once. Pretty cool. All right, before we go, let's take a look at what fan art came in this week. Brandon Nebbit delivers this piece of artwork, which specifically references a critique I had about Ron Lim's art in Infinity War. Nicely done, Brandon. Eric Burns liked my review of Planetary, so we made up this riff on the Comic Tropes team being the Planetary team. Very clever. Philip Sasko was recently watching my episode about Star Trek in comics and was inspired to draw me enjoying Romulan Ale. Here's a link to more of Philip's art. Terry Parr sends in this amazing character based on my recent Samurai Santa look, and uh, there's his Instagram for more by Terry. Finally, Ian Stratton was inspired to create this adorable comic featuring me looking at a comic book called Pancake Man that apparently inspires me to drink an entire bottle of Everclear. Do you want me to die, Ian? All right, so every week I feature any fan art that's been submitted to this address, comictropes at gmail.com, as long as it has something to do with this show. And then I draw a winner out of that pool to win a gachapon prize that I picked up in Japan. This week Ian said that he's okay uh, not being in the drawing, so that means I've got four numbers here. I'm going to just drop them into a bag, shuffle it about, and uh, figure out who wins the Gachapon prize this week. Number three, that is Philip Sasko. Philip Sasko, you won the prize this week. Let's take a look at what it is. By the way, this Gachapony machine was donated to us by Lunar Shine Store. Thank you for that. All right, almost got it. Here we go. Um, mm, I can't tell. I never can, can I? I, oh, no, I do know what this is. You know what this is? I got this at um, New Japan Pro Wrestling. I went to, uh, that, that's a uh, wrestling promotion in Tokyo, and they had gachapon machines there. It's basically a series of different wrestlers doing a weird bridging thing, and you can stack these things on top of each other. So that's a pretty unique one. Uh, congratulations, Philip. I'll send that your way. Um, We've got some more X-Men related content coming. 
I love Uncanny X-Force, in case that isn't abundantly clear. Uh, I would love to just simply break down the story, but then I'd be spoiling it for all of you, and I definitely don't want to do that. Uh, if you've already read it, then you already know it, and if you haven't read it, I don't want to spoil that for you. I just wanted to talk about some of the aspects in it that I really enjoy. Uh, one thing that maybe I didn't even get into quite enough is that I think that Rick Remender has a great sense of humor. Um, he's all of his books, no matter how serious, will usually have some levity to offset it. And I love that contrast. Uh, I've met Rick in person many, many times. Um, I, I guess we're not friends because we don't hang out, but, but we definitely know each other. And, and he's just a really nice guy. Uh, I met him a, originally a long time ago. I'll just tell a story. This is just story time now, okay? So I was at, um, I want to say Wizard World Chicago back in 2004, I think. Might have been 2005. Uh, anyway, we were uh, hanging out. Um, also Tony Moore and a bunch of other friends and stuff. Uh, some of them artists, some of them not. And we were uh, making paper plate masks while drinking. I know that this is weird. We were taking paper plates and making various masks and I made one of Jason Voorhees which had, you know, two eye holes. And um, if I can find an image of uh, me and Rick, I, I think I have some pictures of us with, with some of these plates. But Rick decided that it would look cooler if he stuck his balls through the holes. So uh, he tried to do that. Uh, it didn't work. I don't have a picture of that. I'm pretty sure if I did, he would uh, not be happy if I shared that. <laughs> but he tried! <laughs> so he's a weird, funny guy, but I also think he gives a lot of thought to his stories. They're not just action. Um, there's a reason to care about the characters so that the action uh, pays off. Um, it's very important. Anyway, that's about all my thoughts. I sincerely appreciate all of your support. I hope 2019 is good to all of us. Let's uh, let's continue with X Month. Take care. Keep reading comics.